Hello, everybody. Thanks so much uh, for joining us this afternoon. We'd like to uh, first acknowledge the generous support from Paladin for making this speaker series possible. We have an excellent speaker uh, today, Dr. Sonia Cressman, who's joining us today from British Columbia. Uh, Dr. Cressman studies the economic and equity impacts of healthcare decisions, and her research is driven by the need to understand how healthcare systems innovate to improve sustainability. She's a health economist at the Center for Clinical Epidemiology and Evaluation, which is based in Vancouver, and she's an assistant professor of professional practice in the Faculty of Health Sciences at Simon Fraser. She specializes in evaluating risk models and complex healthcare decisions and has done extensive work on lung health and also in evaluating the uh, societal costs of depression. And she's a member of, of the large international community of kidney transplant specialists working towards improving the efficacy of kidney allocation decisions and how such decisions affect access to and outcomes from kidney transplantation in Canada. And that's exactly what she's going to be talking to us about today. Uh, Dr. Cressman's talk today is titled Modeling the Economics of Kidney Transplantation in the Post-Genomic Era. Uh, and this talk will have some clear links to the talk given as part of this series on October 23rd by Dr. Paul Keown and Dr. Ruth Safir Pichazde, who spoke about their genetic research on precision allocation in kidney transplantation. So that talk, as well as this one, and all the talks from the series are available on YouTube. You can just type Alberta Transplant Institute into YouTube search and you'll, you'll find them all there. So yes, this talk, Modeling the Economics of Kidney Transplantation in the post genomic Area, it takes um, a look at precision medicine as well, but provides us with more of a policy management perspective and incorporates mathematical models from health economics, comparative effectiveness research, and operations management disciplines. So Dr. Cressman will tell us about how these models have been used for economic evaluations and the need for a, a whole disease approach, incorporating a need for greater collaboration across disciplines to work through these complex policy decisions involved with kidney transplantation. So just before I pass it off to Dr. Cressman, I'll say that after the talk, we're going to have a Q&A session. So there you can post some questions that you have in the chat, or you can raise your hand and uh, yeah, we'll get to those questions. So I'll pass it off to you, Dr. Cressman. Okay, so thank you so much for the kind invitation to come here. This is a really exciting new phase of research for me um, as a health economist at the Center for Clinical Epidemiology and Evaluation and a member of the Can Prevent team um, that you heard from uh, uh, last week. Uh, so some members that, that lead the team, Paul Kion and Ruth Sapir Pisrashati, who are um, part of a project I'm working on with the Center for Clinical Epidemiology and Evaluation. I'm also an assistant professor of professional practice at SFU. Um, that is actually where I'm coming to you now from Burnaby Mountain. Um, this campus is uh, located on the Musqueam, Squ Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Katsi, Kwikwitlam, Kwaykwat, Kwantlen, Simiamo, and Tuasin First Nations. Um, I am really grateful for this land and the, um, the honor of being able to, to work here and speak on it today and be Thing that comes to mind for me when I think about this area is this this beach near my house where I take my son to swim where I used to when he was little and thinking about how I hope that he'll be able to do the same when he has kids or his friends do um, that's something I'm really grateful for and what means means something from my land acknowledgement for our learning objectives today I'm hoping to give this audience and appreciation for costs, utility, and outcome inputs as they're um, included in a cost effectiveness analysis. And my feeling is that I'm working with really a broad uh, range of expertise in this audience. Um, and so it, it, I've kept it a very general focus uh, and a really simple um, cost effectiveness analysis um, framework, which is just one piece of economic evaluations. Uh, the second learning objectives I'm hoping to leave you with is the ability to understand the breadth of mathematical models out there today and how they're commonly used in the kidney transplant process and um, to get an appreciation for the need for whole disease approaches, collaborations, and uh, why they're so necessary as we um, enter the era of precision medicine in um, kidney transplantation, it starts to become a clinical reality. Uh, I've broken the talk into four parts. I'm first starting with the introduction of cost effectiveness analysis, then I'll go through a review of transplant models that we've uh, done just recently in our team at C2E2 and discuss the CAN Prevent study from an economics perspective and how precision modeling will 
fit into all of this. Um, so first part, introduction to cost effectiveness analysis. Um, so economics being the science of choices uh, in, requires a special discipline of economic called health economics. The reason for that particularly is the deviation from a perfect market. Now in a perfect market, you know what you are going, you're buying. It's uh, everybody is equally aware and the consumption of what you're buying is non-rivalrous. So when you buy something, it doesn't change your position as a consumer. And that certainly does not apply to healthcare. Uh, when you consume healthcare, you hopefully get better and that changes your position. So that's the, the key concept of why health economics is, is really important to give you a, an appreciation for this difference. And um, I'm gonna take you toward the more perfect market than the health economics market. I'm gonna take you to the shoe market because everybody knows what, what it's like to need shoes. And if you buy a pair of shoes, you won't really change your uh, need for having those shoes. So I'm gonna invite you to think about this question about a hypothetical $140 I would give you. And I'll tell you why I chose this number shortly. Um, but if I were to hypothetically give you $140 to spend on shoes, you would consider, of course, the costs. What could you get for $140? You'd probably consider how long are they going to last and things like that. And then you'd consider some other things that are really personal. Um, and we call those utility uh, to summarize the attributes that relate to your personal um, gain on life. So if you're a dancer, you probably want some shoes with great heels and, and a good um, bottom to them. And, and it, so just to get an idea of who's in my audience, what you care about, if you could put in the chat some of the things that you consider when you um, purchase shoes, and I, I guess keeping within the $140 um, benchmark. So I'm just going to start this off and tell you something we consider in Vancouver quite a bit. Waterproof. Yes, quality. And I think people in Alberta need something that uh, is going to get around in snow, right? I, I don't know. Uh, comfort, style, fit, this is great. Yeah. The, thank you. So these are really um, useful descriptions of your personal utility, and it's different for everybody, I see one person saying comfort. I think stylish and comfort are sometimes two different um, attributes and, and give, mean different things to different people. So it's very individual, if you see what I mean. And yeah, there's got to go with the, the shoes make the outfit. So thank you so much for Patricia for talking about the existing wardrobe. I can totally relate to that. Um, and yeah, we can optimize our utility. Um, and these are these are things that go into a decision of cost effectiveness, not just how long does a shoe last, which would be more of an outcomes, but also what do, what sort of utility do we get to it? So going from a nearer perfect market of the shoe market, <laughs> I'm going to move you to the health uh, healthcare market in a second. But let's just imagine for one moment that I'm in charge of buying the shoes for everybody at the Alberta Transplant Institute. And with the information you just gave me, what would happen if I chose this? <laughs> I don't see anybody disconnecting, but um, this is one sort of $116. That's within <laughs> the price. Um, and, and it's definitely one of the, it can illustrate the pitfalls of decision-making. So. Yeah, I, I could have made that completely wrong, not knowing it, just thinking, oh, what's your utility? Um, so there has to be kind of a certain way to, to measure utility that, that's comparable across different disciplines. And I'm going to take you now over to the imperfect market that we work in, uh, healthcare. And it's really hard to see what you're getting in healthcare when you balance out cost, utility, and outcomes. You could imagine, well, how would you spend $1.38 billion on kidney transplantation? And, and that's a, a complex question. How do you, okay, okay so you've got the $1.38 billion, you've got outcomes, you probably want, um, you, you know, uh, survival, obviously, but uh, graph failure is, is a big issue. Um, utility, 
This, this one in healthcare, we measure with a very standard instrument, um, it, quality of life based, prefer, uh, then they're preference weighted instruments. The one we use very commonly is called the EQ5D, and I've shown you a version of it with five levels called the EQ5D5L on the left. Um, this instrument is in a really practical sense, it's very easy to give a, in a clinical setting. It takes five minutes to 10 minutes. Um, there's five main attributes that we consider to be a really important part of utility. And um, it's not perfect by any means, but it is comparable uh, for different types of diseases and it's considered very general. <laughs> I, I'm looking quickly at the comments in the chat and th th that's a great, great conversation. Um, so the mobility attribute is one of the main ones. and if you have no problems in walking about or slight problems in walking about moderate, severe and unable, there are five different levels to this attribute. And so if you were to score perfect on all of these domains, so the mobility, self-care, usual activities, pain and discomfort, anxiety and depression are the main domains. If everything was fine, you have no problems with any of them, but you had one problem with mobility, maybe slight problems walking about, you would not have a perfect year of life if you had that, that difficulty. And so we would be able to adjust the year of life that we get from survival analysis with a disutility um, that reflects this score on the utility instrument. And so one year of life would um, convert to 0.84 a quality adjusted life years when you make the adjustment for disutility. This is very specific for Canadians. If you were in the UK, it might be 0.82. And if you were in the US, it might be 0.86. And it, it's really based on the preferences of the population. What we're, we're going to do with that information is uh, to find another metric that we use to communicate cost effectiveness in the literature. And it's got a very cool name. It's called the ICER, the incremental cost effectiveness ratio. Very simple math. It's just the difference in the, the total costs of the intervention minus the difference in the comparison or the standard care uh, divided by the total effectiveness of the intervention minus the effectiveness of standard care. So it's delta C over delta E. In, we have the incremental costs. Watch for red in this presentation. I've coded everything, every input that relates to cost is red. We have the outcomes, green, the quality adjusted life, or the, the life years gained. If you multiply that by the disutility, utility, you get the quality adjusted life years gained and incremental cost per quality adjusted life years gained is the, uh, the ICER, the weight dollars per quality in short. And that's sort of the abbreviation. Um, it gets complicated with the modeling. You have so much information, so many costs, so many um, probabilities, uh, 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 mortality, you have relapse rates, you have things like that contributing to your outcomes, and then you have different utilities. And what I've shown you here is a transplant model I've done previously for a different um, situation. It's for stem cell transplantation, and it was um, published in the British Journal of Hematology in 2016. And this, um, particular decision was right. Can you see my cursor moving around? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, so the comparison was a new genomic panel, and that was compared to individual molecular, molecular analysis. And the cost difference was about $250, considering um, that each of these molecular analyses are $250 each. Um, and a genomic panel was about 1000 and we test for three molecular analyses. There's also a ton of costs for um, getting a new diagnosis for acute myeloid leukemia, which is the disease that this, this particular genomic panel um, was used to inform decisions for. So at a diagnosis, a person can have a $5,000 health state um, for, for the diagnostic workup. At a diagnosis, their utility or quality of life is very low. So 1.0 would be a perfect quality, adjusted, quality of life um, and then there's a lot of disutility uh, at an at intermediate risk uh, diagnosis for AML. When the patient transitions through the treatment pathway, through induction, 
to their first complete remission, they, they reach a decision for whether or not the physician would apply a transplant uh, or else just assign chemotherapy to cure the disease. And this genomic test would provide information about who to assign to transplant. And the reason is because it's high cost, but also a really high risk procedure that the treatment related mortality risk down this pathway um, is, is quite high, but hopefully a, a patient will get to this pathway where their quality of life um, ex uh, extends over 10 years. And this is a survival pathway. If they go by the chemo route, they can also um, have a, a lower treatment related mortality rate, but they end up traveling through Mark uh, through a long-term survival model, and I call it Markov-1 for short, um, that involves their chance of relapse and chance of a complete remission after relapse. So this is a fairly detailed model, but what I want you to focus on, one, are the costs. There's different high, high cost health states, two, the outcomes, so probabilities of being assigned this treatment, and then also mortality rates here. Um, and then the utilities that after the long-term utility after uh, the, the chemotherapy route, it, it ends up becoming um, quite stable over time. So 0.83 back up to what we think is close to normal. And then um, over time with transplant, it also improves up to 0.74 and survival is quite, quite, um, uh, quite a lot better after transplant. So from this study, the model went and did its calculations and um, conditional probabilities applied and utilities applied to each health state. And at the end of the day, we got an ICER. So a total of 1,500, uh, $155,508 for 3.838 qualities gained with the ICER average person um, would experience those costs and get that many life years gained if the genomic panel was used to guide treatment decisions, mostly because more people went to transplant as a result of the, genome, the information from the genomic panel. The ICER was uh, quite reasonable. Um, anything below 50,000 is generally considered um, reasonable, and that really depends on a decision makers' willingness to pay. In Canada, we we in cancer in Canada in cancer interventions they go up to two hundred thousand dollars per quality, um, and it really depends on one if it's cancer or not, and and two uh, what what sort of competing interventions there are already available. So this was rapidly adopted. It's part of treatments uh, now in, at VGH. It's part of the, it rapidly. It's an in-house diagnostic test, and it displaced a bunch of commercial molecular analyses. Um, right away, I think that's all the information the decision maker wanted to know, but um, what I want you to know is that this is really just the tip of the iceberg, because you've got a number, it says yes, yes or no, we think that's going to be reasonable, but um, how you evaluate it and you, the scope of your analysis um, is re really an important piece of the conversation and thinking about sustainability of this decision in the long term. And I'll show you now my very favorite part of cost effectiveness analysis is when you start to get a feel for what all of the parameters are doing in your model. So there's my base case um, ICER right down the eye of this tornado diagram. And the bars you see going left and right tell you about how each of these parameters on the left are impacting the cost effectiveness. And the ones that have really wide bars are ones that are really important. Um, you could either have a really inefficient intervention, so edging up on the $20,000 per quality, or sorry, $200,000 per quality threshold, which is we, we safe to say that would be considered an inefficient use of healthcare resources, um, down to cost savings, where the incremental cost effectiveness ratio, or the, the ICER, um, is zero. And that it, when it gets to negative ICERs, you get in a, a a space where you're considered, uh, your interventions considered cost savings, and there's really not much conversation about whether it gets adopted. It usually does when you can demonstrate this. Um, the parameter that was most interesting from this particular model was quality of life during Markov 2. So, taking you back to the model, Markov 2 was the long term survival after transplant and the quality of life during these 10 years of, of uh, survival was the most important parameter. If it is low, and it, it seemed quite low in this with these estimates that I, I uh, had in the model, 
if it's low, then it would be the, the genomic test would be less cost effective because the probability of transplant was higher with the genomic test. Um, if the quality of life was actually improved after transplant, if new therapies came along to help manage um, immunological side effects, that type of thing, or it's GB, GBHD in transplant for stem cells. I'm not sure um, how, what the relationship would be with kidney transplants, but this was the most important driver for, for this um, cost-effectiveness analysis. The other one is the relapse rate with the alternate um, chemotherapy. If relapse rates, relapse rates were lower and they could re prevent relapses, um, then the, the decision to assign a transplant would be less efficient. I'm gonna just pause to see if I have any questions or if I've lost any of my audience members. I see 29 of us still here, so this is a good sign. Okay, so now let's go into the kidney transplant world. Um, this section is based on a review that is currently, uh, that is part of a manuscript is under peer review. So I don't really want to just to share it too, too widely. So I'm gonna give you some surface level details. Um, there was a systematic extraction process from the literature. They scanned over 5,000 papers and other sources um, and ended up with 144 qualitative studies that had some sort of mathematical model for the kidney transplant process. Um, of those, 54 were e economic evaluations. 11 were comparative effectiveness studies, and 79 were from operations research management. This is a snapshot of the results because it, it's, it is under review, so I don't want to talk too much about it, but I can give you sort of a flavor for what we came up with. So for the economic evaluations, there were 54 of them um, really heavily dependent on the Markovian cohort models, like the one I just showed you. And they, they tended to focus on pre-transplant or post-transplant. Um, and that is mostly to do with the type of decisions they're answering. So most of them were pharmacoeconomic evaluations and they were made to be able to justify the adoption of a new treatment. The scope was quite limited um, just to a certain budget line and really um, segmented in, in the, in the view of the whole transplant model um, and the whole transplant process from a patient's perspective and, and obviously from the clinical operations that, that are undertaken. The, the models got a bit more sophisticated with the operations research approach. They're focused on optimizing and they include wait list uh, for on hemodialysis as part of the modeling process. They include patient level factors such as their comorbidities, patient um, risk of, of of uh, death for, for many cause, their other, other demographic information, and um, th they're used mostly to determine matching and allocation, and they're internally funded um, by, by clinical teams that want to improve their process internally. The comparative effectiveness analyses are mostly uh, published from the US because they're not allowed to talk about cost effectiveness in some instances, uh, but the, the model structure they've used are also Markovian cohort ones um, and focus on specific interventions and um, specific clinical outcomes that are of interest. The recommendations from this review process came from the overlap of research efforts and thinking about how all of these different models are publishing um, as the same disease, but with different views and how th this is, it could really improve the efficiency of research if greater collaborations were made, uh, especially across disciplines. So if we could take the power of the operations management modelers, combine it with the economics and um, comparative effectiveness research expertise and our, our fabulous clinical teams um, to get models that really represent what's, what's happening through the entire uh, kidney transplant process, we, we felt that that needed to be recommended because there's overlap in the research um, and the, there's a really a need at this point in time to consider individual characteristics and thinking about the um, incoming technology from precision medicine like Paul and Ruth uh, mentioned to you last, uh, a couple of weeks ago. 
So our call is for more collaboration and um, really to build these um, powerful new models. And that's exactly what, what we're trying to do in the Can Prevent study. Um, this study team, you met the two on the left. And Tim Caulfield, I think, is in Alberta as well. So you might have run into him. Sterling Bryan is the uh, leader of the Can Prevent um, pillar that I'm working on. And he's here at C2E2 and uh, main investigator on the Can Prevent study. Um, I won't talk too much about it, just to, you probably know there's four main goals to develop strategies for epitope-based matching. Uh, we've also got a pillar devoted to prognostic and predictive biomarkers to um, Im improve the uh, ability to detect events like early, uh, like a graft rejection at a really early stage. There's also a, a team of scientists working on new therapies to avoid premature graft loss and increase the quality of life after transplant. So that's that, that um, input parameter I was mentioning to you earlier um, that really affected the, the uh, stem cell transplant decision. So uh, it, it's very interesting to see that, that that's an area of, of um, investigation and can prevent. And in, in pillar four, this is the one I'm working on, we are gonna evaluate the societal and economic implications of these, these three strategies. You may have seen this slide. Um, summarizing the pillars in the Can Prevent study. Pillar one, based on epitope matching. I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a minute. Immune monitoring is the early detection of grass, graft rejection and um, personalized immunotherapy to treat um, early rejection. And this is pillar four where I am. Um, Tim Caulfield's leading the legal and policy guidelines. We've also got patient partners as part of the pillar four team. Um, where there is a public engagement activity going on now. It's a deliberative dialogue um, with, with people who have end-stage end kidney disease or, or have experienced the transplant process um, as part of this conversation. And this is my, my piece here, uh, working with a really uh, wonderfully skilled um, dis discrete event simulation team to build a discrete event simulation model and use it for an economic evaluation. So I, I found this picture of eplets and epitopes, and I wanted to use this to give you a feeling for the intervention that we'll be evaluating in the cost effectiveness analysis. So this is um, sourced from an uh, uh, American Journal of Transplantation editorial, which really summarizes the, the intervention um, based on the, sh the way eplets change the shape of the epitope. Uh, so this would be an HLA class two molecule on the, um, I think it's the donor or the recipient. What, what, I think it's a donor and the donor specific anyway. I'm not too sure. I think I'm tripping up on which side this is on, but the, there's an eplet mismatch. And at some point it will change the shape of the epitope and it's recognized um, and, and, it, and, and, it, uh, and, and makes um, antibody mediated rejection response. And that can be prevented if we can predict how many of these epilet mismatches occur and, and how, how we can change the shape of this recognition event. I probably bitch, butchered the immunology, um, but I did do a biochemistry PhD, so I wanted to give it a shot. Uh, that was almost a, a, a two decades ago. Um, the, number of these eplet mismatches will contribute to a compatibility risk score. And this is one that's been recently proposed um, based on uh, a validation study looking at tacrolimus exposure to modulate different risk groups of donor specific antibodies. You can have zero to 21 mismatches, um, it, sorry, between, it, 21 and 14 mismatches would be would push you into the uh, high risk zone. If you get between 14 and six, you're in the intermediate compatibility risk zone. And then um, around six or eight DR or DQ uh, mismatches, you would be considered low risk for, and this is for uh, graft rejection. And 
with this information, we can reduce the number of people that have uh, early graft loss effectively. So we would do a decision analysis comparing epilet compatibility based matching approach, looking at the diagnostic costs that would be involved, anything additional um, uh, that affects the wait time as well. There'll be uh, days on hemodialysis that will contribute to the direct medical costs. We also look at the societal costs. And these are costs borne by patients, families, employers, anyone external to the medical system we try to capture in this costing methodology. Um, the quality adjusted life years are, are going to come from literature for this. Um, that have There are several longitudinal published studies that have used instruments such as the EQ5D to be able to assign a disutility value and adjust our life years into quality adjusted life years. So this is just a conceptual model of the approach that we're doing and can prevent at the moment to build a model that is capable of incorporating all of the patient characteristics for people on a wait list for transplantation, such as their age, comorbidities, uh, whether they've had, uh, whether they're a highly sensitized population and their disease status of how, how um, their, their kidneys function and simulate um, the amount of time they're on the wait list, their mortality rates, and uh, the, the days on hemodialysis and the costs. And we have a, a utility value of 0.74 that has been published for, for people on hemodialysis. At the date of transplant, they transition into a post-transplant module. Um, there are costs of the transplant based on living donor, deceased donor. They've been well published in the Canadian literature. Um, but the post-transplant process uh, will also include patient specific parameters like the compatibility risk from the epilet matching uh, demographics and comorbidities. And based on these characteristics, we'll be able to simulate transition through these different health states, um, a graph loss and death that are our immediate focus. But we think that as the technology from the other pillars comes up, we'll be able to have some estimates about how we can um, prevent or treat early rejection. And we think that will be an important health state to include in the model. When there is graft loss um, and rejection, patients will return to hemodialysis in this part of the model and their quality of life after transplant is, is a bit lower than before. Um, and then the post-transplant, the, the best process is maintenance over time and death from another cause in, in this model. So as pillar one brings us the information from epitope matching, we, we're going to focus on this decision. There's also room in this model to look at immune monitoring, advancements from precision medicine and um, immune therapy. We can imagine in 10 or 15 years time that these are all part of one precision approach to transplantation and outcomes uh, for survival, graft loss are significantly improved with the combination of these uh, approaches. So with that, I, I, I will say that we, here we are with, with that same comment, it's just the tip of the iceberg. We need to know information about the patient preferences for these different health states um, and treatments. We need to know about the societal costs and the, the, how the public values allocation based on epilet matching. And um, something I'm personally interested in as part of my research, research program is an equity impact analysis about how the benefits are distributed um, across the population and what the baseline distribution of health is for kidney transplantation. In summary, um, the modeling of costs, utility and outcomes for new invention is really just the tip of the iceberg. That's the, I, I don't want to leave anybody with the impression that I think economics is the whole story because I certainly am learning over and over again that it's usually just the beginning. Um, I, I think the importance of these interdisciplinary collaborations cannot be overstated. Um, the ability of us to improve our efficiency as researchers really requires collaboration um, and uh, interdisciplinary work on models that represent the whole disease. Um, and the computational power that's available to us at this time
I need to close with gratitude to people at C2E2 who have been a really important part of this process. Mo Ashgardese and Steven Schechter are the operations uh, research modelers that are building the discrete event simulation model. Dr. Louise Edwards is running the public deliberation at this time. Heather Ross is our um, project support for, for uh, research administration and Sterling's lead of the study pillar. We've got people from the um, immunology lab at VGH right now, where I actually just went to this week for the first time um, and our study leads of the Pillar 4 team and our patient advisory committee that um, has been really helpful in giving us guidance uh, about how we design the research, the questions that we're asking, and we meet with them regularly as part of the Pillar 4 team. I also need to give um, gratitude to the, the wonderful um, Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations that I live on and um, for your time here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sonia. That was great. Um, as you were giving your presentation, we did have um, some questions and some comments in the chat. So the first question came from um, Anne Halpin. I can basically just summarize her question here. She was, or Anne, if you would like to ask the question, I suppose I can just summarize it. And if I'm incorrect, please, uh, please hop in to correct me. She's wondering if the transplant related costs, maybe that you'd include in the models include the, um, the costs related to, to donors and to donation. So all the different pro processes that go into that, she's listed here, workup, surgery, or long-term monitoring. Yep. Um, so for kidney transplantation, absolutely. The, the, I, I have a wonderful recent publication of somebody who's gone to town with that information. So it's actually been done with someone who knows a lot more about it than me. I'm going to try and dig that reference up for you to, to show you what they included. And if I, I think they've, They've hit everything. They they look at the donor specifically, um, and did living versus deceased, uh, and really got into the details. That was also a study commissioned by Cadiff for um, costing the transplant process. Okay. Thank you so much. I was I think my question was thinking about sensitized patients and that we may have like a lot more donors that need to be worked up for a sensitized someone with lots of antibodies versus not and if like a, maybe a minor cost but and then long-term monitoring which maybe doesn't happen as much for donors as it should be and and maybe that's like just not included as a cost because it doesn't happen but it may impact donation rates overall so it's very nebulous but, but yeah interesting. I want to go back Go back to the first one. I think that that might be something that I need, need to consider as we go forward that the, the highly sensitized patients, they have sort of a different prioritization scheme. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking about your question. You're saying that the number of donors per transplant is higher for this group. Uh, sorry, I guess I'm thinking in the context of living donation that like many more people would be having to be tested, typed, worked up, potentially cross-matched for those individuals, as opposed to someone who's easier, like no antibodies, easy to match. And I think that's part of the can prevent, like they're, they're focusing on highly sensitized patients in, in great part. So I just was curious if that, it's not a big cost perhaps in the grand scheme of things, maybe it doesn't matter. But I just wondered if that was even if that was a you know something that had come up in discussion. Yeah, no, um, that that's a really good point. I haven't gotten to that phase of modeling, but now that you've brought that to my attention, I'm thinking that it's a resource utilization rate question, like it, how many donors per person um, do we need to screen? Um, and and I, I haven't seen that in the review I've just looked at for the costing. So thank you for the question. I, and I don't have an answer, but I I might. <laughs> Thank you so much. Pleasure. There's another um, question here from Vince Bain for you, Sonia. It says, he's asking, um, why is there a different uh, quality threshold for cancer versus other diseases? Amazing question. This, this, this uh, audience knows way too much about economics. <laughs> um, I don't know. It, I, I really don't, I can't give you a rational explanation for that other than it has been considered a higher priority than other disease areas. So what does that mean? Does that mean um, that it's more important than mental health? Does it mean that it's more important than kidney transplantation? But this is a really good question. It usually ends up with people fighting in a room over where a budget needs to go. Um, and 
it 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 tells you that you can't just make a decision based on an ICER. You have to um, consider the government <laughs> and when their term is up, and you have to consider patient preferences. A lot of the times, what ends up getting considered is advocacy. Um, and and I really can't say I have any answers in that area. It's outside of my realm. But a great question. There is a, another comment as well um, from Jed Gross, who is kind of reflecting on perhaps the problematic aspects of a term determining an average quality and applying that average quality to ac across a different population. Do you had any thoughts on that? I wanted to reflect on that. Yep. Yep. No, we need to do it distributionally. We need to disaggregate by in kidney transplantation. The big one I think we need to worry about is age. I know that the younger patients are particularly affected by affluent compatibility um, interventions uh, quite a lot, but we need to disaggregate by age, sex, um, race, race, all of these. And that's the extension of cost effectiveness analysis that I'm quite curious in as part of my research program is um, an equity impact analysis where you look at the distribution based on these different groups. Yeah, nice yeah, hi, your... Jed, if I could um, jump in. I'm an ethicist, so I don't do economic modeling on a daily basis. And I guess my question as a follow-up is, if we bracket off the considerations of equity for a moment and just think about this in terms of utility, is it possible that better biological matching could actually be um, less utilitarian because it matches, I, I don't know what an example would be, but certain patients, for example, would get organs sooner who are actually less sick. And as a result, you have whatever benefit there is in um, transplant outcomes is counterbalanced by the fact that some people are on the wait list longer. I guess my question is, are the, are the countervailing considerations here purely equitable? And is this like a, a clear winning strategy from a utility standpoint, or is there actually a reason to think better biological matching could have costs that are not economic, but medical? Yeah, that's a really great question. I, I, I think that the study investigators have really thought the same way as you and part of Tim Caulfield's work is really directed at the, the ethical and legal applications of this. And then our public deliberation gets right into allocation decisions. And another note on uh, in response to that wonderful question is that there's also a question of representation in the donor pool of, of uh, some groups um, that don't have a sufficient number of donors. And it might be by race, it might be, um, I, I know sex is a big one because of the pre uh, pregnancy. Uh, I, I actually had to have a, a, a shot. I think Rogam is affected for that. But um, women as well have disparity in um, their ability to match after pregnancy. So th these disparities do exist and um, these decisions are extremely complex. I'm glad we've got a team working on it at least. Um, and I, I can't say that there's a straightforward answer to the, the, the question about ethics. Thanks, Anya. I see uh, Trevor has his hand up. Trevor, do you have a question? Hi, Trevor Schuler, meteorologist in Edmonton involved in <clears throat> transplant. And I also do some work with the, the Surgery Clinical Network in terms of health technology assessment and informed decision-making. And I just, um, uh, congratulations to you for, for doing this work and giving this talk. And thanks to the ATI for supporting um, this kind of a talk. I think it's it's non-traditional science in a way. It's not an RCT. It's not... Um, you know, what, what clinicians think of as traditional outcomes research. And, and I think it's very important and I think it underscores and, and you've demonstrated this nicely, the importance of having the, the expertise as to how to do it properly, which you have and, and involving clinicians. So you get the right variables and sensitivity analysis done with the data. And, and I think um, can't, uh, can't congratulate you enough for doing this and, and the ATI, ATI for putting this on. I, I did have a, a quick question about um, utilities and, and if you have any thoughts, um, you know, I think for renal transplantation, um, developing health utility states for, you know, a younger person versus an older person uh, on, with end-stage renal disease, either on dialysis or pending dialysis, you know, there's a, a few different health utility states there, but they tend to be more chronic in nature. 
Are, are you aware of any work? We, we've tried to do some modeling around renal colic and, you know, obviously having pain from a kidney stone is a very short term um, health utility state that can be devastating, but it, it may only last days or weeks. Um, do, do you have any thoughts on, on how you look at that question? Yeah, I, I know the, the utility for something kind of acute, like in surgery, for example, um, that goes up or, or down due to disutility. And then over time, it kind of um, adapts to it and modulates over time. So that, that tends to be considered in time dependent models. If you're doing a model that is a Markovian classic in, in, or a decision tree, which is the absolute simplest form of modeling, you wouldn't get that time dependence. But depend, if you're looking at a cycle length of a year and it's just one day with the kidney stone, but it's the, the worst day of your life, um, you, you probably wouldn't see it. Uh, you might want to decrease the cycle length that you're looking at or use a discrete event simulation approach where that's uh, calculated on a daily basis. Um, that, that would be one approach. You, you mentioned the youth, and I, I've been thinking about that with this particular decision and thinking about a comment I heard from one of my clinical team members, I think it was actually Paul, who mentioned that adherence to immunosuppressive medication is quite difficult during youth years um, due to the hormone effects. I don't know if that is an issue or not, but that might be something that we don't capture. With, our, with that EQ5D instrument that I showed you that looks at mobility, self-care, pain depression, uh, pain and discomfort and anxiety slash depression. That doesn't really capture it, but it is a really important thing for teenagers um, and, and people that are young. So I, I want to just congratulate you for asking a really important question and acknowledging the limits of what we can do with cost-effectiveness analysis. And I don't, I don't think I've answered anyone, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's a typical economist. It depends. <laughs> Thanks. Next, we have a question from Marie and then a question from Lori afterwards. Thanks very much, uh, Sonia. Very interesting presentation. I really appreciate it. I'm a seven-year uh, liver transplant recipient and very pleased about that. And I've been involved in two organizations uh, quite extensively, uh, and I'd, I'd like to ask you a question and then give you some background. Um, do you think that your approach to analysis will enable the people that take care of the budgets to make decisions to help increase donation? The, back, the background is um, when we started at the Alberta Organization Group, um, uh, a, a uh, citizen-led group who is advocating for Alberta to increase its donation rate, um, it, perhaps uh, based mainly on the uh, deceased donors per million population metric. Um, we started out with a uh, cost-effectiveness model uh, using Markov with the assistance of Scott Clarenbach and Braden Mance. Um, if the decision makers went by that alone, um, it would uh, suggest that one should invest in improving the donation organization part of our system. Um, uh, we didn't move the needle in the decision making uh, with that. So as some of us are from the business community, we went to uh, looking at the uh, really cash budget constraints that seem to be there. And so we did a typical um, capital markets type of, you know, in, in net asset value or capital asset pricing model approach. Um, uh, we we uh, think that that um, will play more appropriately into the positive decision-making of the uh, philanthropic community, um, foundations, corporate donors, uh, Alberta Health System executives, Alberta Health and the Minister of Health, the Premier, the public, and uh, the uh, electorate. Um, and we, we've run many scenarios that 
in whole taken the kind of variability of outcomes. Um, uh, we still haven't moved the needle a long ways, but we have shown that the economics from a cash point of view are very substantially uh, in the favor of increasing donation. Now, do you think your, your modeling can help us uh, get to the point where we can really drive the decision makers at the, the executives at the, at the top of the healthcare systems and the government who control the budgets? That's such a great question. Um, thank you for asking it and thank you for making me think about um, something I forgot to mention. Um, we have a language for valuing research efforts in something that we think is really an important part of the model. It's called a value of information analysis. And it can give us a metric that we can go back and say, this is worth research investment. And you can put that on a grant application. You could put it on, um, in your case, maybe it would be a kidney donation policy, but that, that we have a metric that could do that. It's a, it's a little bit complicated and it, it goes into the uncertainty analysis um, around the, uh, the economic modeling. Um, but th then there's this practical piece where over time I've come to learn that this work I do is either going to support a decision or um, it's going to be ignored. <laughs> and and I, I would, would say that if it's a team that comes together and makes this decision and my models are really just a piece of that team, a small piece um, and the modeling results we put together are a result of our collaboration. But it, it does take a movement. Um, and I, I think that what you've shared with me today has given me an idea to, to look at that aspect as well. Good. Well, I won't take up any more of your time, but I am in Vancouver for the next few weeks. Um, I'd like to be able to uh, perhaps uh, take this conversation a little bit further uh, in this next few weeks. Thank you. Certainly. I'm just going to share my email information for anybody that wants to check Perfect. in with me after this. Excuse me. Yeah, I mean that, that's something that's faced all the time. You know, at, at the, uh, the Health Law Institute, University of Alberta, you create as much evidence as you can, and you hope that the evidence results in regulatory change or policy changes. But I think the very first step of that is producing as much sound evidence as you can to at least begin initiating those processes. That's your perhaps your best chance of doing so. Laura, you have a question. Yes, I just, uh, that's a great, uh, <laughs> that's just a great way to kind of come to the conclusion here, Sonia and Murray, and, and um, you know, but for many years, we haven't included some of those. So this is really helpful, and I'm sure gives, uh, gives us at least a step forward in influencing the decisions that are made, made by our policymakers. Um, my question was, uh, a specific question was a little bit a little bit simpler. First, I'd like to, to thank Trevor for pointing out that the shoes that you showed were uh, urologist shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I quite like them actually, and I, I was gonna <laughs> I was gonna put my <laughs> but um, but um, also the uh, the kinds of things that we try and cover in the Alberta Transplant Institute seminar series. So I'm really pleased by the interest here. The question to you, Sonia, um, you were two, twofold. You you um, touched on it uh, briefly. The, the impact of these kinds of modeling um, exercises on the the particularly complicated situation with children who bear a longer uh, disease burden sometimes, um, because our hope is that if they have transplants at young ages, that they will live for many, many years, um, uh, uh, you know, as long as Murray, maybe. <laughs> and the other question is, uh, can what kind of modeling can we do for those who need to receive or have received hearts and lungs and livers and so on? And do you have any thoughts on that just as we reach the end of our time? <laughs> I'm trying to think of what the question. The first was. question, <laughs> the first question was modeling um, that that can can encompass the needs of children, and the second one was different organs that need to be transplanted. I guess with with the the children, it would be a distributional analysis. So looking at that. The, the baseline distribution of health, how, how many qual, uh, uh, potential life years gained 
um, apply to that population, what their quality of life is, and being able to compare that um, with the, the metrics we have. And then going a little bit more deeper, I think there's a real space for qualitative research in this area. And I think engaging in that, I, I mean, I've got a preteen right now. I think that the, that converse, that those, it's really difficult to engage that population. The EQ5D instrument, I don't think it's, it's relevant to some of the, the concerns that we all forget about after we, we become adults. Um, but I, I, th I think it's an interesting question. I know there are some people that are developing um, youth versions of the EQ5D and sometimes it involves like a visual slider and just a different way to communicate. So that, that's on the horizon. And then the second question about different organs. Um, I, I, I'm thinking in terms of- Well, the uh, issues are a little bit different, of course, because you, you... I mean, uh, in, in, in kidney transplantation, you, you balance things against the cost of dialysis and so on. In heart transplantation and in liver transplantation, you often don't have the, those, the, the, the other therapies that you might consider an, alter, an alternate therapy to transplant often either don't exist uh, or they're, they're much different. And I, I'm just wondering if similar modeling would be useful in those yeah, 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 absolutely. I, I do have a lot of experience in lung cancer. So I, I've talked a little bit of, um, about lung transplants in, in a sense. Um, you're, you're right, they're com a completely different ballgame, but we are looking at a curative model, which is different than the chronic disease models. So you're looking at long-term gains in survival, um, quality of life after the intervention or the surgery or the transplant being really an important issue. Like if you're, as long as the quality of life is better then the, the, the economic sort of point to um, the curative approach is, is worthwhile. Um, th th yeah, it, it's really tricky. I would say maybe this is a great way to close the talk. Do you remember that $1.38 billion I gave you to think about how to spend kidney transplant Shoes. money? Yeah, it's it's yeah, it it is what it costs for graft failure in the U.S. A recent estimate, one point three eight billion dollars, and I I think that the volume of this problem within the population and this disease um, is increasing. So it, it's a uh, it it becomes an issue of our, a population health problem and uh, resources we have for our population. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sonia. That was really just a terrific talk. And thank you for fielding all these questions. Same oh, yes. I love it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Sonia. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for everyone here who um, joined in the talk um, from Sonia, Dr. Crespin.